are, again, talking about serving today as we uh, continue in our BLESS series, and uh, this has been so good. We, we have a vision statement as a church. I think we have a, a slide here that we want to follow Jesus together to see kingdom transformation in our lives, church, and world. And we have these vision milestones for each of those areas, our lives, our church, and our world, to help us know, um, are we accomplishing that as a church? And for the world, which is really anywhere outside these walls, our neighbors, our community, across the country, across the world, wherever God might lead us, and, and here's our vision milestone for that. It's that we would bless our neighbors at home and downtown. We want to really focus on where we're living and where we're positioned as a church and blessing our neighbors in those two areas. And what does it mean to bless? We've got a reminder up here of what each of those letters mean. We begin with prayer. That's where it starts, going to the Lord in prayer, asking him to lead us. We listen with care to people. We learn people's stories and, and build relationships with our neighbors. We eat together. We talked about that last week, which was awesome. We get to, to eat together and, and fellowship to, to hear more of people's lives and share life with them. And then today we're going to be talking about serving with love and sharing your story and his story, the gospel. And we're going to have some, some tangible opportunities coming to actually do these things uh, as, as we continue through the summer. And, and we're going to be sharing those as we go. But today we're focusing on serving with love. And uh, I love what Pastor Greg said uh, a few weeks back, and he said this when we were first walking through this blessed strategy and, and talking about teaching it. Um, he said, if you take out the S's, you're left with B-L-E, which is kind of just bleh, right? That's kind of a dad joke. Well done, Greg. <laughs> That's fantastic, right? But I love that because without the S's, uh, this process is incomplete, right? And obviously, sharing the gospel is, is the most significant one, and that's the heart of this. We want to get to that place where we can share the gospel, share who Jesus is with people. But I think serve with love is also a critical step that has to be a part of this process because it's where the rubber meets the road. It's where faith meets good works. It's where good intentions meet good actions. And that's what we're going to be looking at here this morning is serving with love. And today's text is going to be in Luke chapter 10. Uh, and it's a story, it's a, a text that you're probably very familiar with. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we actually just looked at this text not too long ago. Pastor Jason uh, led us through uh, a little bit of the Good Samaritan back in November during our Church and the Racial Divide series. Uh, but, but today we want to look at it again through the lens of serving with love love. And so open up your Bibles if you have them. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25, and let's read this story together. Luke 10, verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. Let's pause for a second here because the first thing that we see here is that, that Jesus points this, this lawyer and his question about inheriting eternal life back to the law to the very thing that, that this lawyer or scribe would have known. He was an expert in the law, in the Old Testament scriptures. And, and Jesus points him back to that, and, and his answer is correct. He, he quotes from the Shema. We saw this in the Gospel of Mark from Deuteronomy chapter 6, this, this statement of loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself. And this is a good answer. Because Jesus himself repeats this when he's asked by another lawyer. It's always these lawyers asking questions, right? And he answers this question of what is the greatest commandment in Matthew 22. We see this. The lawyer asks him, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul 
and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. By pointing this lawyer and his question of inheriting eternal life back to Deuteronomy, to the law, Jesus, I think, is reminding him and reminding us that we are called to a serving that is Christ-centered. That's the first blank on your note sheet this morning if you're following along. It is Christ-centered. All of the law, all of the prophets, they rest, they depend on these two commandments, loving God and loving others. So we need to know that our love for others, our love for people has to flow out of our love for God, our love for Jesus. It's, it's inseparable. And I've thought about this, how, how I am a much better lover of people. I love my wife and my children so much better. I love, I love my neighbors better. I love you all better when I'm first loving Jesus, when I'm connected to him, when I'm spending time with him. It becomes much easier, not necessarily easy, but easier, more natural, more organic when I am first connected to the love of Christ. His love flows out of me. I think that's the, the point that Jesus wants this lawyer to get here from this first question. But then that response from Jesus leads the lawyer to a follow-up question. Let's continue reading in Luke chapter 10, verse 29. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. We'll pause again here. So the, the lawyer maybe is, is convicted by Jesus, pointing him back to Deuteronomy, and, and realizes in his own heart that he hasn't perfectly loved God with all his heart and mind and soul and strength, and he certainly hasn't perfectly loved his neighbor as himself. So he asked this question, but it's, it's actually a really good question, I think. It's a really logical question because the law says to love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say love everyone as yourself. It's kind of interesting. And so the next logical question is, well, then who is my neighbor? Who am I called to love as myself? And to answer this, Jesus tells a story. A parable. I love that Jesus teaches like this. And we know he tells us elsewhere in, in Luke that the purpose of parables are to give truth and give wisdom to willing ears, to people who are ready and willing to receive and listen, but to confound or confuse those with dull ears that are not willing to hear Jesus' message. And in this story, Jesus tells of a man who's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, a notoriously dangerous road, when he is attacked by robbers. And he's beaten, left half dead on the side of the road. And in Jesus' story, a priest and a Levite both come upon this man, and, and, and these were the religious leaders of the day. They were considered holy and set apart, but they both pass by the man in need. We don't know all their excuses, but we can think of some, right? They, they might have been in a hurry. They've got important work to do. They've got to get to the temple, right? They, they are important people with important jobs. I can't stop to help this man. Or maybe they didn't feel they had the tools to help, right? Maybe they hadn't been through the CPR training, right? It's like, I don't know, first aid, like someone else will come along that's better equipped to help this person. Or maybe they felt it was too dangerous. Maybe they thought it was an ambush, right? If they stop and help this man, maybe they're going to get attacked too. Or maybe, as, as you've maybe heard, they, they, they had a, 
a belief according to the law that they should stay pure and away from, from a dead body or anything unclean. And if they move towards this man, they might be made unclean and unable to perform their service in the temple. Whatever their reasons, the priest and the Levite cross to the other side of the road and leave this man out of sight, out of mind. And then Jesus introduces another character, the Samaritan. And the Samaritans were despised by the Jewish culture at this time because they were from the Jewish line. They were, they were Jewish by line, but they had married, intermarried with non-Jews. And so they were considered this, this separate group of people, a lesser than people. Last week we talked about the other, right? The people that are just different and, and, and look different and live differently. And they were definitely considered the other in this day. And the crowd listening to Jesus must have thought, no way is a Samaritan going to be the hero of this story. I was trying to think of, a, of another example. I, I think it's like telling a story set in World War II and, and the Nazi soldier becomes the hero, ends up being the good guy. And then I thought, isn't that basically the plot of Sound of Music? Like, <laughs> that's what I remember. A bunch of singing and dancing and then the Nazi soldier becomes a good guy, right? That's what I remember. My girls remember all the singing and dancing. But this is, this is shocking to these people listening, right? And notice in verse 33, the Samaritan comes across the man, Jesus says, as he journeyed. And why is that significant? It's interesting that Jesus directs this question of who is my neighbor to a story of what seems like a chance encounter, right? He's just, he's just walking and, and here's this opportunity to serve, but it's not a chance encounter in Jesus' parable. The Samaritan comes upon the man at the exact moment he needs to. The moment of decision. The moment of action. And he responds. And I wonder what are the needs and the opportunities that God has led us to along the journey of life. Sometimes we're, we're, we're wondering so much, God, where are you calling me? What do you want me to do? And it's good to, to pray and as we begin with prayer. But I think there's opportunities if we think about it right in front of us. Alexander McLaren, a theologian, said this. I love this quote. He said, the world would be a changed place if every Christian attended to the sorrows that are plain before him. I wonder if we were just prayerful and, and listening well and paying attention, how many needs and opportunities are right before us along the journey of life. We are called to a serving that is Christ-led. That's your second bullet point this morning. It is Christ-led. Jesus positions the Samaritan right where he needs to be to serve this man and he will do the same for us. He will lead us to serve and care for those in need. And, and he will define the person who is our neighbor. That's part of what Jesus is saying in this story. He's, he's showing that, that he defines our neighbor differently than we do. He says it's anyone in need. Anyone that we have an opportunity to serve. God says that is our neighbor. This is why we talked about the racial divide back in November, right? And not an easy subject to step into. Today is Juneteenth, right? Which has become this like political thing in the last couple of years. Everything is a political thing. This chair is probably a political thing these days. But we, we want to care about these things. Today's a day to, to recognize and celebrate that, that African Americans enslaved in our country were set free. Like we can celebrate that. We can care about those in need around us. When we talk about serving the homeless, when we talk about the Afghan refugee family, it's an opportunity to be reminded that God cares deeply about anyone in need, anyone hurting, and we should care too. And we can trust him to lead us to serve those he would call us to. We can't 
fix every problem in the world, right? There's a whole bunch of them. But we can ask Jesus and trust Jesus and be faithful to serve where he leads us. And that brings us to our third point this morning. I know we're moving quick through this, but our serving must be Christ-like. That's your third point this morning. It must be Christ-like. Let's read the rest of our text in Luke 10, starting in verse 34. The Samaritan responds, he went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three, Jesus says, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. We're going to add a few more C's this morning under that last point. Pastor Nate would be so proud of me and all the, the uh, alliteration here, the, the C's we've got going. So these are the things we see in the Samaritan's response. We see a serving first that is compassionate. It's compassionate. In verse 33, we see that he has compassion on the man on the side of the road. And then he moves moves towards him, he goes to him, he binds up his wounds. It's not enough to just feel compassion from a distance, right? We are called to move towards people in need, to take action, and he does that. It's compassionate. Secondly, it's costly, right? He, he pours oil and wine on his wounds. That would have been expensive to do this, a, a serious sacrifice, and then he sets the man on his own animal and brings him to an inn, which means he probably walked alongside all the way to the end while the other man rode on his animal. He gives two denarii to the innkeeper. He pays money for him. And he, he says, I'll, I'll continue to pay for whatever expenses you have taking care of this man. This is costly. It costs the Samaritan comfort. It costs him time. It costs him effort. It costs him money. It is costly to serve with love. And lastly, it's committed. I love at the end of verse 35, it says that the Samaritan says, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. He didn't just say, all right, I did my good deed for the day, right? I helped this man. I got him to the end, like... I did awesome, right? And we would probably excuse him if that's where the story ended. Like, that's pretty good. He's already gone above and beyond to help this man. Like, he could just move on. But he promises to come back, to pay for any remaining debts that this man might have. That's commitment. Oftentimes, I think I'm tempted to serve in a way that is compassionate but without the cost or the commitment. You know, it's kind of from a distance. Maybe I care about it, you know, I pray about it. Maybe I send a text about it, right? I, I'm, I'm, I'm caring, but I'm not really wanting to, to do anything that's costly or committed. And I think that heart says, well, at least I'm doing something, right? At least I care. That's better than most people. Or other times, I think I'm tempted to embrace a costly serving, but without the commitment, right? I'll give you a day. I'll give you an hour, right? I think that heart says, don't ask too much of me. I've got boundaries here, and it's, it's good to have healthy boundaries, but a lot of times, I think, for me, it's just selfishness. Not wanting to get in too deep. Other times, I might be serving in a committed way, giving my time and effort to help someone, to serve someone, but I might be doing it without compassion, with a cold or even a resentful heart. I think that, heart, that kind of heart says, you better be thankful for what I'm doing for you. Or what am I going to get in return for this? Christ-like serving has all three elements. It is compassionate, 
It is costly and it is committed. I think we can sum that up by saying that is sacrificial serving. And here's where we come to the point that I believe Jesus is making to this man and to us in this story. It's interesting, the, the very first question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And, and we know, and Jesus even, even pointing the man back to the law is, is reminding him and reminding us that, that we cannot perfectly obey the law. There is nothing we can do. There is nothing we can accomplish to inherit eternal life, to be forgiven of our sins. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 make this clear. Paul writes, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. So why then does Jesus tell this story? And why does he tell the lawyer, you go and do likewise? Why doesn't he say, repent and believe, right? Follow me. He has different responses to different people. Why, why does he say, go and do likewise to this man? Well, first, Jesus was telling this parable to answer the lawyer's question, to guide him to the right application that, that he is to love his neighbor and his neighbor is anyone he comes across in need, even if it's someone he might consider an enemy. But even more, I think Jesus sees through to this man's heart. And he knows that this man needs to learn what sacrificial service looks like. And what it looks like is Jesus. There are lots of interpretations you can find about the Good Samaritan and its meaning. And some of them are like really out there. And one of them is maybe Jesus is saying, I am the Good Samaritan. And, and I don't know, it doesn't seem like that's clear in the text, so I don't think we can say that for sure, but it's impossible to read this story and not think of Jesus, right? Because like the Samaritan, Jesus was an outsider. He was despised by the Jews. Like the Samaritan, Jesus came after others failed to meet a need. Like the Samaritan, Jesus enters in sacrificially, providing healing and mercy to the needy. And like the Samaritan, Jesus has paid it all and has promised to come back again. So when Jesus tells this lawyer and tells us, go and do likewise, I think what he's saying is this, go and learn who I am. Learn about my heart. Learn about my ways. And the way that I have loved and served you, sacrificially, Philippians 2, 4 through 8 is such a beautiful summation of what Christ has done for us. It says this, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus is our perfect model of serving with love. And now he calls us to do the same. Because through serving, we declare the gospel to others and to ourselves. We're reminded of what Christ has done for us. So what might, like, what, what might let that look like for us as we serve and bless our neighbors? I think there's a lot of ways that could look for us. We might be able to, to serve a neighbor and, and do some yard work for them or, or uh, perhaps uh, provide childcare for a family in need in our, in our community or for a single mom or fixing a, a car or a problem in a house if you have those, those tools and that ability. Or maybe it's helping with a need that, that God simply brings you across as you journey through life, just like the Samaritan. 
we moved into our neighborhood about two and a half years ago, and the, the first time I met uh, two of my neighbors, two, um, uh, two middle-aged ladies, and, and the first thing they said, I, I said, my name is Jeff, and they said, oh, you're tall. You're tall, right? And so I'm like the neighborhood light bulb and, uh, and smoke alarm changer, right? Like that is what I get called in to do. And it's about the only thing I can fix anyways, right? I'm looking at people who know this about me. Um, but, but hey, it's a simple way. I'm tall, right? I, I joke that's my, that's my spiritual gift is my tallness. But it's just a simple way. And I've gotten to have conversations with people in our neighborhood from just changing a light bulb. And that's opened up opportunities for me to share, to pray with people. What might that look like for you to serve with love? A few weeks ago was the Lighthouse Dance Recital. Who got to be at that? There's a few of us, yeah. So Lighthouse Dance uh, is a, a business and a, and a ministry here in downtown Loveland that's owned and operated by a family in our church, Eric and Melissa Holmland. And they do such an incredible job. Uh, just an incredible ministry. And um, every year they do a spring recital, which is all their dancers come and they do routines and routines. I'm probably botching that, but they do dances, right? They, they do dance stuff. And uh, it's amazing. Like, like, it's not some simple little recital. Like, it is professionally done. It's amazing and powerful. There's always a gospel message to it. And this year, uh, one of the fa- my favorite things about it is the music they pick for these songs and these dances. And One of the songs this year was a song titled Craig by Walker Hayes. He's actually a secular artist, um, so I can't endorse all of his music, but this song is really powerful because he talks about a a Christian man named Craig that he meets and the way this man blesses and serves him. I just want to read a few lyrics for you as we close this morning says this, I met Craig at a church called Redeeming Grace. It's like he understood my I don't want to be here face. I felt out of place and I smelled like beer. But he just shook my hand and said, I'm glad you're here. He says, we'll all be judged, but he was never judgmental. And even though my songs don't belong in no hymnal, he'd quote my lyrics and slap me on the back and say, Man, you've got a gift. How do you write like that? Yeah, I know. He sounds cool, right? Not your typical kid from Sunday school, right? I still ain't figured out church yet. But Craig? Craig, I get. Now, we can't walk on water or turn the Napa Valley red. But he just might be tight with a man that did. He's not the light of the world, but I wish mine was bright as his. Yeah, he just might be tight with a man that is. I think we're surrounded by people with needs that are wrestling with truth, with who God is, with what's going on in our world, with what the church is and what this is all about. It's confusing. But sacrificial service, they get. They will see and experience Jesus in us, through us, when we serve with love. And in that process, we ourselves will be reminded of what Christ has done for us. The perfect model of sacrificial service who laid down his life for us so that we could have life and we could know his love and now share that with others. I'm gonna invite the worship team back up. We're gonna have communion here in just a moment. And as we do that, I would just encourage you to first and foremost, thank Jesus for what he has done for you. If you've trusted in him as your Lord and Savior, he has been the sacrificial servant that has given his life for you. He's our perfect model, and and we don't have to accomplish, we can't accomplish salvation in our own efforts, but it is only by grace through faith in him and his blood shed on the cross, his body bruised on the cross for us. That's what we remember when we take communion. So the worship team's gonna be playing, and I'm gonna pray for us, and when you're ready, just come on forward to the stations, grab the elements, and then you can take those elements when you go back to your seat when you're ready, but let's reflect on what Jesus has done for us, and then 
Maybe ask a second question. 